Welcome. Thank you for coming um, for today's event. Before I introduce um, our speaker, I should introduce myself, perhaps. My name is Geneviève Zabrisky. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology, so I work with Professor Gocek. Um, and I'm director of uh, CPPS, the Copernicus Program in Polish Cities, and CRIS. Uh, we have here our coming attraction. Um, if you did not write down the dates, I invite you to do so in the next 30 seconds or so. But basically, next week, we have uh, an Albanian Community Summer Fellowship Info Session for our students. Um, but on January 28th, we have a talk by a new assistant professor at the U of M. She just joined us this year, so I hope you will come here, Professor Elizabeth King, uh, who will lecture on women, vulnerabil vulnerability, and HIV in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, but now I want to introduce our, our speaker, Muge Gocek, who's professor of sociology and women's studies here at the U of M. She was educated in Turkey and at Princeton University, where she received her PhD in sociology in 1988. She's a fabulous colleague, teacher, and mentor, and an important scholar. She has um, authored four important books on Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, and she's the editor or co-editor with also Ron Suni here of two additional volumes on the Armenian genocide and on nationalism on the Middle, Middle East. And I will forego the list of chapters and articles she has written because they're, you know, countless. Her talk today is based on her book published just this fall by Oxford University entitled Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and Collective Violence Against the Armenians, 1789 to 2009. So she's taking the long durée to explain a phenomenon that is still actual today. This is an intellectually ambitious book and a politically courageous one in which Professor Gocek carefully reveals the complex overlapping processes involved not only in denying violence against Armenians in Turkey, but also making that denial a quasi-sacred element of the Turkish state raison d'etat. So we're thrilled today to have her present some of the key arguments of her book and invite you uh, for the Q&A following the talk. Thank you so much for coming. Well, uh, whoops, yes. Uh, thank you, Genevieve, uh, for having me here. And thank you, all of you, for coming. This is the book. I'll put it here so you get to see it. It's very thick. thick so if anybody doesn't agree with me, I can exercise violence. <laughs> yeah, probably some more. Yeah. Can you d turn the back ones on at least? The ones she in the back? Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Um, although, you know, you don't have to turn all, uh, all the lights off. If you just turn the, these on off and the others on, that should be fine. Because they'll fall, they'll fall asleep otherwise. <laughs> well, violence is a depressing topic. On top of it, if you're in dark, in the dark, you may just fall asleep. <coughs> Thank you. That would be perfect. Yes. Uh, well, I first of all, uh, it was interesting. I've given talks on this uh, book uh, for a while now, and I realized I've given talks all over, not only the United States but the world, with the exception of Michigan. <laughs> and it's interesting that you know now I finally come back, and I think it is very uh, appropriate that I give the talk here <coughs> at Chris, uh, because my friend and colleague, Genevieve, uh, asked me to, and uh, I have to thank her, and I did in person in the book, because she's one of the few courageous people who actually read the entire manuscript uh, before I uh, published it. And I say courageous because uh, this manuscript was uh, about uh, 800 pages. Uh, it had to be chopped down a lot. And there are two people who read it in its entirely, entirety. You're one. And the other one, of course, is my partner in crime, uh, Ronald Grigor Suni. Uh, to him, I also owe uh, a lot of uh, 
thanks and gratitude because uh, I realized that uh, we started uh, what's known as the workshop on Armenian Turkish scholarship, what's where we brought scholars who wanted to talk on this issue beyond the politics and the contention. Uh, our first uh, meeting was uh, in the year 2000 at the University of Chicago. So it's been 15 years since we've been struggling with this uh, issue. And I just realized that we had a meeting uh, uh, about uh, a couple of weeks ago in Istanbul uh, planning the next Watts uh, conference workshop that is going to be, interestingly enough, in Istanbul, Turkey. And when we sat down and put together with our uh, local colleagues uh, the actual list of people we could invite, uh, I, was, I realized what a big difference it has been. We almost didn't have enough people to draw on in the year 2000. Now there are too many people to draw on, and now we're thinking, how are we going to you know, uh, pare it down uh, to a manageable size? And I think that demonstrates the shift that has taken in uh, the, uh, in the uh, way in which uh, this topic has been approached. When I first uh, started working on the topic, um, I was interested, basically, uh, in why uh, violence has been naturalized and normalized in Turkish society. That was my starting point, because I, as a Turkish citizen, as well as an American one, have always been uh, uh, anxious about why democracies do not take place or do not gel and operate in certain societies, and why this wasn't the case in Turkish society. At the time, uh, after getting tenure, I was going to write a book on uh, the rise of the Islamist movement in Turkey initially, in the 1990s. But what happened was that when I started working on the topic, there were many military coups that happened. So whenever I talked about doing the sort of, you know, studying the Islamist movement, my colleague said, well, if you want to sort of study the power, it's the military that you should be studying not the Islamist parties, but at the time, if I studied the military, that would have definitely put me behind bars. So I decided instead, I asked the question, why is it that Turkish society especially welcomes and accepts this violence? Why is it? Because in a way, a military coup is also a symbolic political violence as well. You know, and why are we so keen on accepting this? And I said, there must be, for the, Violence to be normalized in Turkish society, there has to be a foundational violence that hasn't been accounted for, that has led to this normalization. What is the foundational violence of the Turkish Republic? So I, tried, I started to see uh, Turkish history through violence, went back and back, and the first unaccounted violence was the one that took place right around the time the Turkish Republic was established. Uh, the Republic was established in 1923. The independence war was fought between 1919 and 1923. And the Armenian genocide took place between 1915 and 1917. That is how I arrived at the Armenian genocide. And I always talk about this because it, when I started this, it was so politicized that people thought I must be Armenian if I'm studying this. And I said, no, I am not Armenian, really. They said, well, uh, it's interesting. Both sides may have the same reaction on, on the radical ends. The Armenians said, no, you probably have some Armenian blood in you, un unbeknownst to you. And that is what makes you uh, approach it the way you do, because obviously they said, deep down, these are, you know, you're a very civilized person, and there must be some blood in you that makes you so civilized. Likewise, though, it was very heartening that the Turkish nationalists had exactly the same reaction. They said, there must be something wrong with you. You cannot be pure Turkish. Your blood must be tainted by some other black blood, like Armenian blood. And that is probably why you are saying the things you're saying, because you are not <coughs> of sane mind. So in a way, I'm giving this as an example of, of the how it difficult it is to approach political uh, matters. And that is also probably understandable in a way how long it takes for one to academically try to approach uh, such uh, uh, matters as well. 
because not only do you have to try to study the issue, but you also have to make sense of the knowledge that's available to you and the interactions you have while trying to get that knowledge. As people attribute, uh, you know, uh, basic uh, characteristics to you that have nothing to do with the scholarship that you know you're engaging in and so it has been a very interesting process as I lost many friends I made many new ones but the good thing about it is that at least now all the friends I have are those that I have personally chosen rather than ones I had acquired by chance throughout my life I have lost a lot of childhood friends uh, because of my stand especially in relation to what is going on in Turkish state and society today. Because to this day, unfortunately, 15 years after we started, I was certain by this point that the Turkish state and society would acknowledge the genocide, but they still haven't. So in a way, uh, that is uh, why we need to, of course, keep trying on things that uh, we know as academics and uh, want to uh, disseminate uh, as well. And that is why uh, it's a good thing that I worked on this book. Uh, it took a very long time. It took me uh, literally 12 years to write. But uh, I'm here to share uh, the results with you. And I gave you a sense of where I came and where I am with it, because my subjectivity, I think, who I am as a scholar, where I come from, also is intricately related to the subject matter that I have studied. Uh, I do belong, uh, by definition, to the group of ethnic Turks uh, that perpetrated the genocide. And I think, therefore, as Hannah Arendt says uh, always in her works, uh, I am not guilty, but I am responsible. I am responsible in the sense that the Turkish state and society to which I belong still does not acknowledge uh, you know what went on and because of that I personally apologize as an academic and as a Turk to all those Armenians uh, not only for what transpired uh, in the past but also for <coughs> the continued denial because people argue that the denial uh, <coughs> denial is the last uh, stage of genocide in the sense that by denying what happened uh, you prevent healing from happening. And we need that healing uh, to happen not only by the Armenians, but also by the Turks also taking responsibility in uh, the way things transpired uh, throughout the time. And that is why uh, I wrote this book. And I hope that it will help that healing process uh, somewhat. And that is why I studied, uh, in particular, the denial of violence. To me, what happened in 1915 uh, to 17 is not, well, if I say is not important, that obviously defeats the purpose. Whether it is or not a genocide is not the issue. The violence is there. I have no problems whatsoever with that. What I am interested in is why do states and societies deny that violence? To me, that was the more pertinent question, because the other is a given. Of course it happened. You know, That is a politicized debate, those who argue against it. But even if it did happen, I think the more important uh, question is, why did it happen in the first place? And the second place, why is it still persisting? Uh, the denial of it is persisting to this day. And that is why I focused instead on the denial of violence and the subtitle is Ottoman Past Turkish Present and Collective Violence Against the Armenians. And you will be interested in, of course, uh, the date here. It's 1789 to 2009. As you see, it is not 1915 to 17. Because uh, from when you look at it in terms of the denial, of course, that brings you up to the present. The denial still continues to this day. And if you look at uh, what has happened in terms of the violence committed against the Armenians, it doesn't start with 1915. It predates it. Uh, and that is why I had to go back all the way to 1789. And I ended up with 220 years, which makes historians definitely pass out. But it was important <laughs> as a sociologist 
to try to see it in a much larger uh, framework from the perspective of violence on the one hand and the denial of that violence on the other. And that is why I chose 1789, not because that auspiciously was the year of the French Revolution, although that was important as well, but from the point of view of uh, Ottoman history, 1789 is the coming to the throne of Selim III. And it is the first time modernization and modernity, uh, sort of westernization, starts occurring systematically in the Ottoman Empire. So by choosing that uh, point, I very much espouse uh, and follow uh, the work of people like Zygmunt Bauman and uh, Michael Mann and others uh, who have uh, underscored uh, the, the underbelly of uh, modernity, the inherent violence that modernity itself contains, while on the one hand uh, espousing democracy, on the other hand it also very much instigates polarization. And that is why I have uh, started with 1789. What I will do now is to take you through various slides so that you get the main argument and then hopefully we'll have enough time for discussion. So if you start with 1915, uh, the contested memories are, uh, you know, what is the root of denial? The standpoint of contemporary Western scholarly community and the Armenian diaspora is that this is one of the first genocides of the 20th century that occurred during 1915. I say 22 because that's the end of the independence war and the violence sustains and continues till then with the intent to annihilate, and that's of course the intention is very important, between 800,000 to 1.5 million Armenians. If you look at the standpoint of contemporary Turkish state and society, however, the denial is that it is not a jo uh, genocide, but reciprocal Turkish-Armenian massacres with unintentional destruction, largely due to travel conditions of Armenians departed from, uh, deported from the war front due to military security, leading to 100 to 400,000 Armenian deaths and at least 1.5 million Turkish war times deaths. In case you're wondering how uh, the about two, two million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire were able to annihilate one and a half million Turks. Uh, here you see the first faulty analogy, basically. In a way, what's happening is that uh, the one and a half million Turkish deaths, wartime deaths are mostly deaths of soldiers during World War I. What they're doing, basically, is, of course, equating the deaths of uh, the civilian deaths of Armenians by their own state with the wartime uh, deaths of Turkish soldiers by enemy soldiers. And that is why you get uh, this. And you will see time and again, especially when politics are concerned, they bring two totally, utterly incomparable things together with the intent, of course, uh, to deny. And that is why you have this. But the important thing for me was how and why did the standpoint of uh, state and society continue to this day? And why is it that uh, people living in Turkey still mostly adhere rather than challenge this, uh, this uh, conception? I must, of course, make a, a caveat and exception. I mean, I will talk about it later when I'm discussing it through history. But at the moment, Kurds in Turkey are the ones who have uh, publicly acknowledged uh, the genocide and their role in it. So that is an exception. There are also many liberal uh, Turkish scholars, uh, scholars of Turkey, who are uh, Turkish or not. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, but those who, do ha who have taken more and more a stand against this uh, denial. But they are nevertheless not the majority. How could we go from those who acknowledge it that are still a minority to the rest of society, to full acknowledgement of this past violence? That is what I'm looking at. So the research question was, we do this in sociology so that you, know, you have the research question, just in case, right, Genevieve? Uh, why the Turkish state and society deny what happened to Armenians in 1915 and 
The question is, what does it entail? When did it start? And when will it stop? So what you do, of course, when you approach such a topic, the first issue is what resources, what empirical sources are you going to use? And this is usually extremely contentious. What has been used until now are official state documents. And that is why you have a lot of debate on what these documents are. You know, what do they say? But uh, everybody here, all the, you know, all the scholars, intellectuals, and especially historians know that you can interpret documents in many different ways. In a way then, the official documents are just as socially constructed as any other source of information and text. If that's the case, in the case of official documents, what you have naturalized and normalized is the state view. And of course, the state always gives agency to those that, to its own officers, uh, offic officials and officers, and it does not give especially a voice to those who are perpetrated, you know, who are victimized by the documents. And that was not what I wanted to do. I did not want, I wanted to go beyond the public and official stand that official documents contained. And that meant that I had to look at other sources of meaning in society beyond the official one. And the possibilities were the literature, oral histories, and memoirs. Literature, especially minority literature, is extremely significant. We have some students here who are working, writing their dissertations on that. But it is still uh, developing as a field. And it has started to develop, especially in the aftermath of the Cold War. Um, and it doesn't go extensively as back as I wanted. Another possibility were oral histories with especially uh, survivors uh, in, in Turkey and elsewhere. Given that to this day, advocating uh, acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide publicly comes with a, a legal sentence that ranges from uh, uh, one year to uh, three years depending on whether A, you do, the, uh, advoca uh, you know, the, you do the advocacy in Turkey versus if you do it outside of Turkey. That goes to two years if you do it outside of Turkey. And if you are a Turkish citizen doing it outside of Turkey, which will be my case, then it's three years, technically. Uh, so that, of course, inhibits such studies, although there have been recently ones, especially uh, interviews done with Islamicized Armenians by uh, scholars like Ayşegül Altınay and Leyla Nezi and others in Turkey. But to me, the most interesting one was, of course, contemporaneous, mostly Muslim Turkish memoirs. And that is why I focused what I focused on myself. And uh, memoirs can, of course, be very uh, prejudiced in the sense that it only reflects the individual standpoint. It's often written after the events have taken place. It could be selective. But being a sociologist and therefore uh, thinking of things very broadly, I thought I could overcome that by trying to read and go through all the memoirs that were published in Turkey, in Turkish, in the aftermath of the 1928 alphabet revolution that Latinized the script. Because I figured if I was able to look at all those uh, memoirs in Turkish script, in Latin script, these were technically potentially things that were available to Turkish society that could have, they could have read this, these. And uh, in spite of the availability of this information, they still engaged in denial. And that is why it was important for me to try to look through all these uh, uh, memoirs, and I will explain a bit more what I meant. But of course, what's also important here is that I also wanted to contextualize the violence against the Armenians across time and space. And that is why I look at the past and the present, the interaction of domestic forces within society with outside forces, as you will see, and also the interface of structural and cognitive processes. How was, what were events, what were the events going on and how did the society interpret those events? I think that is both extremely important. 
Historically, then, I looked at uh, the course of Ottoman history with respect to the denial of uh, violence, collective violence. <coughs> and this is uh, important. Uh, I looked at the, took an in-depth in textual investigation of 297 memoirs, 315 texts, penned mostly by Muslim, Turkish Muslim officials. I went through probably about 800 memoirs that I could get my hands on. It took a very long time to collect them. That's why it took a long time as well. And I read all of them uh, and took uh, notes on those that had any information on violence, violence against minorities especially, and violence against uh, you know, Armenians in particular. And I then transcribed, uh, well, uh, translated all the pertinent parts into English uh, and uh, had a database, literally. That was a thousand pages long, single spaced. So that was my database. And from that data then, um, I tried to then see <coughs> patterns and structures. And that is the basically, the, uh, at this point, uh, you name a memoir and I probably know something of it at this stage. Uh, my theoretical framework, as I said, is that there is this European modernity. W what is important is how it is interpreted by Tur uh, Turkish society. <coughs> I call it mirrored or situated, and we can talk. That's a theoretical discussion where the state and society are the two actors that negotiate. And what's important is there is social polarization. Now, what's very important is that social polarization exists in all societies. We have it also in our own society. But what is very important is how do you go from polarization to violence? Because that is, of course, a very major step that you take. Uh, if you are expressing your, uh, uh, you know, your frustration by taking physical action against those you think are the culprits. That, it is in that context why I put together the structural elements with cognitive ones in the sense that public emotions, I think, are very important in that uh, um, step to the collective violence against Armenians. And especially uh, nationalism is a very important ideology within which that takes place. And what is also interesting is usually if you have collective violence in societies, you would expect there to be acknowledgement afterwards. You know, in a way, if you think about our own society, if you think about the violence against the Native Americans and African Americans, we have to a certain degree acknowledge that these things exist. If it were similar to the situation in Turkey, it would be like we would deny that there was any violence against those groups. And we don't do that. But of course, yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> OK. But uh, <laughs> well, yes, uh, but we do not usually give, uh, I mean, if somebody denies it, uh, they do not legally have backing for their denial, at least. So from that point of view, I think there is a difference. But it's important, nevertheless, to see these things comparatively, to understand the extent, especially, of the denial. What is very important in this context is uh, William Sewell Jr. has uh, this uh, idea of eventful uh, approach and certain events that are used as turning points in coming to terms with the violence. And I draw on that and argue that at certain junctures after uh, the collective violence against the Armenians occurred, there were other uh, uh, factors that events that happened either before, during, or after the violence that were employed by the state especially in justifying and legitimating the violence. And this occurred also throughout Ottoman and Turkish history. And that is why to this day we have what I argue in Turkey is this collective layered denial. And that is why it's so hard to take it apart. So what was particular about the, the la uh, layering. I divide the violence, if you look at Turkish Ottoman history, into four phases. The first phase is 1789 to 1907. That is uh, the so-called imperial period where the Sultan is in, uh, 
basically uh, ruling. The modernity that you have is spearheaded by the military, so it is mostly uh, you know, uh, the Turkish uh, officials and officers that become uh, modernized on the one hand uh, in the bureaucracy and the state, and you have also, of course, the modernization of the minorities, especially Armenians, in the commercial spheres. And what is very significant in this context is the polarization that occurs within especially the Armenian community. This is when the tensions between the Bolis or Istanbul or urban Armenians and those living in Anatolia, the provincial Armenians, start experiencing different polarization. And that is something uh, to think about because the Sultan enables uh, all minor the religious minorities in the Ottoman Empire to accumulate wealth insofar as they do not convert that economic wealth to political wealth. So if you are apolitical, you can accumulate wealth, even if you are an Armenian. If you start politicizing, that, it is when, that is when you get into uh, the trouble. So basically then, what happens is that those Armenians who are rich and who live in Istanbul are very much working together with the Sultan and his policies if they want to succeed. And they are, because of the trade with the West, getting wealthier. The problem is that is not the reality of the Armenians that especially live in the eastern provinces, because this is a time also when the Kurds are being resettled forcefully. There is a lot of land disputes between the Kurds and uh, uh, the Armenians. Uh, things are being, because of modernity, uh, becoming much more uh, bureaucratically defined. This is when title deeds emerge. The notion of private property emerges for the first time in the 1850s. And many Armenians, especially many Armenian monasteries and religious institutions that have had lands for centuries but do not have any documentation for the position of their, those lands, see those lands being taken away from them. So that you see a lot of conflict in uh, the provinces. And it is no accident if you look at the the 1894-96 massacres, that most of these uh, rebellions take place in the provinces, not in, in, the, in the city, I mean, in, in the imperial center. That is because of, I argue, of this divide within the minorities. And what happens is that even though there are massacres where about 100 to 300,000 Armenians die, uh, it is uh, not acknowledged as such. Nobody is punished for it or held accountable for it. And instead, what happens is that in Armenians are so frustrated with the aid of those who are living in the Russian Empire that come and, constant, I mean, and participate, especially in the eastern provinces, in order to draw world attention and the attention of the great powers to them, they take, undertake the first act of ur urban terrorism they take over an Ottoman bank in 1896 with the intent to draw attention. And this is the first time Ottoman public opinion, I mean, public also becomes aware of the Armenian issue, so to speak, according to those memoirs that I look. But what is very interesting is that what happens is that these Armenian revolutionaries take over the bank, but then the Sultan says he will not negotiate, but nevertheless he will pardon the ones, the revolutionaries that survive. And uh, the, the bank uh, director is a, a French guy who has a yacht. Uh, the revolutionaries are marched out of the bank into the yacht of the uh, French director and taken to France. Uh, so they basically go, on, I mean, they do not have to account for the violence they did either. And this gives Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, II, who is then the ruler, the occasion to say, see, the Armenian problem is not a domestic problem. It is an international problem instigated by the great powers. And here you see the Armenians went to where they initially came from. And that is the first denial, is the denial of the domestic origins of the issue. Because the reason behind 
the Armenian frustration is not the provocation of the great powers alone. That, of course, plays a rule, role. But nevertheless, the main reason is the failure of the Ottoman reforms. It's the failure of uh, settling injustice within Ottoman society in a fair way. All those domestic origins uh, from the vantage point of the Sultan, rather than acknowledging his own failure or the failure of the Ottoman system, he instead reflects it on the great powers. And this is also very important. It continues to this day. If something unsettling happens in the Turkey today, always the first culprits are the West is there one way or another. I mean, that is something extremely important to demonstrate how denial with us even today, uh, to this day. So then I will go very briefly on the other ones. The second one is more political. The uh, polarization occurs within the dominant uh, majority. This is when you have the emergence and uh, penetration of Western institutions, goods, ideas into Ottoman society. And you have Western educated uh, elites uh, mob, you know, that are coming uh, through the, the classes on the one side and the traditional Ottoman elites that rely on experience on the other. And then you see the clash of what is known in Ottoman as the Mektepli, uh, you know, uh, versus the Alaylı, as they say. Those that come with the experience they have and those who have had formal education. And you see the two clashing. And of course, the most significant one is the constitutional revolution by the younger elites, the young Turks, that are educated in Western style education, I mean, institutions and such. And their destruction is what they call ethnic cleansing, insofar as what they consider to be the ideals of modernity, of establishing a nation through violence. And that is uh, what you have. Again, in this case, the polarization will lead to the in initial success of the, of the uh, young Turks that undertake uh, systematically the destruction of the Armenians. And what is the rationalizing event is the preceding Balkan Wars, where a huge number of uh, Turks die in the Balkans against the newly established Balkan states, and nobody expects that uh, result, uh, including the great powers. It is a devastating disaster where millions have to flood the empire, and they have no place to be settled as they're coming in. And this is uh, very important because the West plays a very hypocritic, critical role in the sense that they say before the war, they are so certain, as is the Ottoman army, that the Ottomans are going to win the war. They say, regardless of what happens, the boundaries will stay the same after the war, as they were established before the war. But after the war, when uh, the Balkan states uh, have overwhelming uh, victories, they say, and the French uh, uh, uh, Minister Clemenceau says, especially wherever the cross enters, uh, it cannot go back. Uh, it has replaced the crescent, and it should stay as such. And in a way, basically, the West turns and recognizes uh, what it said it wouldn't in the first place. And they see, the young Turks see this as the ultimate betrayal of, of the West, of the great powers, of Christians, so to speak. And since they do not have the power to take on the Christians of Western Europe, they turn, I think, against the Christians uh, in their midst who are actually their own subjects, who have been you know, there uh, for thousands of years, and, and who are also helpless because they are civilians. And that is one of the reasons why that then disaster is used to deport the Armenians with the intent to destroy them. Uh, and that is the second denial that occurs, is that the intent is destruction, but they say they are just deporting them. Uh, and what happens, happens during the deportation. So if you think the first one is the denial of the origins, the second one is the denial of the act itself. The third one happens uh, with the establishment of the republic, where you, of course, have the denial of this time uh, the perpetrators. 
A lot of the people who perpetrate these are young Turks. They are in very significant uh, leadership positions. Almost all of them survive unscathed into the Republic. The former perpetrators become the heroes of the <coughs> Turkish Republic. Not only are they not punished, instead they become either presidents, prime ministers, or ministers of the new Republic. As a consequence, their, their past violence is whitewashed. And this is the reason why the Turkish state cannot acknowledge what happened before the Republic was formed, because the people engaged in perpetrating it are still uh, considered heroes in Turkey today. It means that you have to literally rewrite uh, Turkish history for that acknowledgement to happen. Who do I have in mind? It is not Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who was, I mean, one of the reasons why he has offered the leadership of uh, the independence struggle is because he wasn't stained by the Armenian genocide. Uh, but others are. İsmet İnönü is very important. Celal Bayar, Tevfik Rüştü Aras, and many others are implicated in what happened. Uh, I did a study in this context looking at all the people in the First National Assembly and what were they doing between 1915 and 17. In about 25 to 30 percent of them, people in the First National Assembly are directly implicated in the Armenian genocide. So that gives you a sense of the continuity and the denial. Uh, so they survive with that. So then it's the denial of the actors. And the last phase is the phase that occurs from 1975. That is when some Armenian uh, terrorists called the Justice Commandos of the Armenian Genocide or the Armenian uh, uh, Liberation are. Asala, what is the Armenian? <laughs> For the liberation of Armenian. Oh, God, I forgot what is that. Well, anyhow, the important is that they assassinate Turkish diplomats, about 38 of them total, between 75 and 86, in order to again draw world attention to what had happened. But Approaching violence with violence does not work. By doing this, obviously, they are taking out these diplomats in a country which has put, invested a lot of resources to develop these diplomats, give them education, and suddenly they are being taken out just by being officials of the Turkish Republic. And this is being done in a context where, because of the educational system, Turks have no idea, younger generations, of what happened in the past. The past has been whitewashed. I had no idea uh, when I came here and an Armenian at Princeton said to me, why did you massacre all my, my grandparents? And I said, I haven't massacred anyone to my knowledge, neither have my parents. I mean, but in a way, you realize that continuity. Uh, that was because I, rather than saying, these people are crazy and they're my enemy. I said instead, what is it about the past that I do not know? And that is why I didn't learn about any of this and had to come here basically to learn my own history. So in a way, not only are people being assassinated, the public has no idea why these people are being assassinated. And if you look at the discourse which I looked at uh, during the, you know, the memoirs, all the diplomats and everybody thinks that it's either the United States or the Soviet Union that are like putting the Armenians up to this because they have no idea of why Armenians, what happened to them in the past, right? So that is the most significant rationalizing event that I think is related, I see as evidence of violence since the establishment of the Turkish Republic, the assassination of Ferran Tink, who was a a journalist of Armenian origin. And that, I think, with that, what the Turkish state does is rather than try to acknowledge what happened in the past, at the time I was a graduate student at Princeton, and we got these letters saying from the Minister of Education, if you want to do a dissertation proving Turkish innocence in the Armenian issue, you'll have full scholarship. And I'm saying. <laughs> 
And then what job will I get after that? I mean, you know, I just threw it to the side. But obviously, some others took that. And official historians came to be who were there not to understand and seek and research what the issue was, but instead to develop a narrative. And it turns out, according to the memoirs, there weren't too many takers either, because obviously we know the rules of scholarship. So this uh, Kamran Inan, who is a uh, retired ambassador, in his memoir says, we, dis we invited all these scholars to Ankara. We told them what to do. And he says, not only did they not do what we told them to do, they had the audacity to tell us what to do instead. So obviously, they were all sent back you know, to their universities because probably they said, this is not how you do it. So what do they do well, instead? They re recruit instead retired ambassadors who know Ottoman with the intent to go into the archives and to prove that the assassinations here demonstrate a continuity with Armenian rebel re rebellions from the 1890s onwards. So that is how the scholarship of denial, the, scholar the scholarship that the denial of is based on emerges. When ambassadors look, they only look at what promotes, obviously, supports their stand and totally dismiss what doesn't. And since they're looking at numbers, they put numbers any way which they want, reducing in the process any responsibility for the violence against the Armenians in the sense, and, and on the other hand, supporting uh, a lot of violence that was done against the Turks at any juncture of their history. And that is, I think, the last stage where there is uh, uh, the denial of the responsibility of violence against the Armenians. And that is basically the uh, argument in the book. Each of them, each stage, is supported mostly by uh, the memoirs of officials and officers that are of Turkish origin. Uh, and in a way, I didn't on purpose read survivors' memoirs until I finished the book, because I wanted to see what the narrative would have been from, you know, within the society from the standpoint of the perpetrators. And I'm happy to, well, I'm not happy. I'm <laughs> content to tell you that uh, there is one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the survivors' narratives and the narratives of Turkish officials and officers. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I can manage, thank you. OK, yes? Uh, I haven't read your book yet, but uh, have you contributed in your book to the role of the Kurdish militias? Oh, yes. Massacring, uh, fleeing uh, Armenians? Yes. Yes, actually, the role of the Kurds go both ways. There are some who uh, massacre them. There are also others, especially in the Dersim region, that protect them. So that you know, it is much more varied than one uh, assumes. Uh, and there are also included in that, uh, in my memoirs, since there are so many of them, some memoirs of Kurds uh, as well, uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish officials and officers. Uh, and yes, I have included anything and everything you can imagine under the sun. Yes? Uh, I have uh, actually three questions, I hope you don't mind. Okay, First, sure. Uh, so this coming Monday is going to be the uh, eighth year anniversary of Ferranting's assassination. Yes. Extraordinary yeah. events, you, had, you know, people in Istanbul going out in the streets. Yeah, yeah, um, again. What has changed in Turkish society since his assassination for the better, for more dialogue? Yes. The second question is, uh, what has this, the, the uh, AK uh, Party, uh, yeah, the, the Erdogan, Erdogan and his party, how have they changed the discourse? And the exactly. Third thing is, how has the Turkish state assessed uh, its responsibility for their sea massacre? I mean, it, it that yes, way. yes, yes, yes. Well, those are all three very good questions. You obviously know what's going on in Turkey. The first one is, uh, as I told, uh, you know, mentioned the Hranting assassination. Uh, what was very important about it is that right after the assassination, people took to the streets. Uh, 
uh, about 100,000 or more, saying we are all haranting and you know, we do not approve. So that there was obviously a, a reaction. And uh, in a way, I asked uh, many of my uh, friends in the diaspora what if they did uh, feel a difference since then. And it is interesting, that probably is the trauma of our generation in Turkey, because we did not expect at all this to happen. We were all a part of this the liberal group of intellectuals. We were trying to do things, better things in Turkey, democratically. Among us, Hrant was the only one who was Armenian, and he was the one who was mass, uh, you know, assassinated. We weren't, because we were ethnic Turks. I mean, and that, of course, is extremely significant. My friends in the diaspora say that many Turks who had been on the fence until then basically joined. So it did, I think, uh, propagate many Turks who happened or tried to be neutral to take a stand. And of course, uh, most of the stand now has been uh, supporting uh, you know, uh, the acknowledgment rather than, uh, I think, uh, the denial instead. So that is the positive movement that has happened. With respect to AK Party, I thought because violence uh, by the Young Turks was also committed against Islamists because the Turkish Republic was originally secular. So anyone who wasn't secular was also marginalized. But instead what happened, uh, rather than sort of thinking because they themselves have experienced oppression and suffering that they would be more empathetic in understanding to the suffering of other groups like the Alevis or the Armenians or the Jews or the Greek Rum and others. Instead, they still think they are the victim and they are much more focused on vengeance. They want vengeance against the uh, former secular Republicans. And therefore, that has not happened. Erdogan, now who has become president and obviously is very power hungry, is much more focused on getting power and showing those secularists how wrong they were, rather than moving on and bringing in others, especially the Kurds. I mean, you know, and I think he is marginalizing them. <coughs> Last year, he uh, issued a public apology of sorts. He did one also in the case of the Dersim massacres. And I have a piece comparing the Dersim apology and the apology to the Armenians, neither one of which, according to the standards of apology in the scholarly literature, are apologies. Basically, they are rhetorical devices with the intent to contain rather than uh, transform. So they're not going anywhere. Yes? If, uh, if there's um, an official, uh, well, I guess, legal penalty for acknowledging uh, genocide in Turkey, how are you able to have a conference in Istanbul well, yeah, the, very good, very good point. It's interesting. For example, I, on purpose, whenever I give talks on this uh, as a Turk, uh, I only give it in university settings because the rules of the the, the dialogue here are set, uh, and we all respect each other in terms of the exchanges. I never try to give any talks outside because there, usually, people will come up and you know anything goes. So my People, especially officials, I talk to say, well, you can talk on this, but do not take a stand publicly. So as long as we don't give interviews, we do not somehow you know, uh, make this a big public event. If it is a workshop that takes place within a university setting, it's OK, because then it is an academic endeavor that we're not trying to proselytize our views. That is the distinction they have. But there's always the potential. And of course, I'll be in for three years. Ron, you'll only be in for a year. So when here we When we first went to Turkey, <laughs> I asked Bugay, I tell this story often. I asked Bugay, I said, well, this is 1997, before we even started. What if I go and give this talk that I'm planning, invited by this <laughs> <Before> talk? <laughs> the fall could be check, yes. We'll teach you, I'm sure. <laughs> I said, Bugay, what, if, what could, if, could something happen? And she said, Oh, if anything happens, we can get you out. <laughs> so I went and gave the, gave the talk. Nothing and happened. Paul said, I'm leaving soon anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. So in a way, there's a very fine line 
how you engage this topic. And as long as I do it uh, scholarly, I'm safe. But if I try to take uh, you know, on uh, to, to the newspapers and everything and become a public figure, then I probably will ha take on the wrath. I already do get, I mean, I do get death threats and everything. Interestingly enough, mostly from Turks living in the United States. Immigrant populations are much more conservative uh, than actual, you know, Turks, which is interesting. Yes, go ahead. I just wonder what you think, and if you, in, in Turkey now, the, people talk about this more. Yeah. They get hung up on the language. It's politicized. It's the G word, right? Yes, so yes. They can refer to massacres. They can refer to tragedies. They can refer to atrocities. Of course, yeah. Turks were killed too. I mean, they were, right? Yeah, Turks exactly. Were killed, right? But yeah. it was, you know, we know the balance of how it, how it occurred. I wonder if you think politically about how this might get resolved around that G word, right? Yes, what, yes. What can be done, what's this. likely to be done that might be enough or likely that may be enough for both sides, or is yeah. it Im Im yeah. impossible? Well, it's the G word and the whole idea of, of sort of saying or not saying genocide, which we actually had disagreements uh, to begin with. Because I was not, uh, I did not want to use the genocide, I mean, the word genocide, not because it was not genocide. I totally knew it was genocide. But the problem is, in Turkey, if you use that word, or when you say it's genocide, people stop listening to you. It's the opposite here. Here, if you don't say genocide, people think, hey, you're down the dark end and, you know, they don't touch you. So it wasn't for that reason I said, and if I believe that this was based on prejudice, if it, of course it is to a certain degree, but it was the lack of knowledge and information in Turkey. Because if you don't know anything about what happened in your past, then if somebody says, you massacred my grandparents, your first reaction is, no, I didn't, you know, not to your knowledge, obviously, right? So because of that, I said, I will not call it a genocide until Turkish society knows what happened or learns what happened. But I think, to me, the turning point was uh, the Harantink assassination, too, you're asking. I mean, after that, I said, anything goes. I couldn't care less, you know, whether they learn it or not, because if they are able to engage in this level of violence, I'm calling it what it is. And now that the book is out, they better read it and learn. So in a way, I, am, uh, I do not want to be as insistent on the use of the word as uh, diaspora Armenians are. But I have no problem with it either. And in Turkey, some use it, others don't. Again, it's not because, I mean, among the liberal intellectuals, it's not because they don't agree with what goes on. I mean, that it is a genocide. They just don't want to close off their communication with Turkish society at large. That is why. So it is a very touchy topic. But now, at this point, we've moved beyond it, right? After our work, uh, <coughs> we accepted people with or without that uh, acknowledgement. Because we had, when we first decided to have the first meeting in 2000, we had an Armenian scholar who wrote to Ron and said he wouldn't come until every Turkish scholar who was there wrote a note and publicly acknowledged the Armenian genocide. And I remember you saying, Muge, I wouldn't even write such a note myself as a scholar. That's not what we are here for. And that's when we decided that shouldn't be in involved in any of the discussions. And I think we are able to now generate an alternate knowledge base, one that brings together both Armenian and Turkish perspectives. And with our students here, especially at the University of Michigan, we make sure, for example, people studying this period, the Turks learn Armenian, and the Armenians learn Turkish, and they study together, they work together, and they approach the sources together. And I think that is the way to go. As always, as I was telling my undergrads, social change is very very slow, I found out, <laughs> even though we want to see change very quickly. And I think it is by building such knowledge that we will be able to overcome this. And by having scholars who know both sources of uh, research. Yeah, go ahead. I have two questions. Sure. Is your book available in Turkey? I was just there at Bilgi University. 
they, they are translating it. They are going to translate it. Although they balked and said it was too long, but <laughs> we'll see. Secondly, you, you did speak about um, wanting a healing. Yes. And I am of Armenian descent, and I do want a healing yeah. with the Turks. I, I, I, want, I want to go back to that country and, yeah. and say, this is, you know, this is, this is part of my family. And I have been back, but, and it's been very mixed. Do, do Turks want a healing? Is there any sense of wanting a healing with Armenia? Well, this, the, problem is, the problem is because of the denial, Turks in Turkey think the Armenian problem is the problem of Armenians. This is why I started my Turk talk by saying this is the problem of Turks. They, do not, they say, well, if Armenians want it, we'll give it to them. Well, that's not the issue. I mean, they have to see the adverse effect it has had on Turkish society. That lack of accountability for the violence that they have done has perpetrated violence in Turkey. It has destroyed the moral fabric so that, you know, people, anything now goes. We have no moral uh, scruples by which to judge things. People lose their faith in humanity. Of course, the victims lose their faith in humanity because they have been wronged and nothing is being done about it. That which is terrible. But we do not realize that the perpetrators also lose their faith in humanity in a different way. They also you know, suffer because they think they can't do anything. Whereas the Armenians, the victims think they can't do anything, are, are totally immobilized by it. The Turks then think they can't do anything under the sun and they can get away with it. And they don't therefore do anything by the book. The legal system doesn't mean anything. And then you have a lot of corruption and you know, personal gain put above everything. That is what the Turkish society has to realize. The damage this denial has done on society itself and on the state itself, on promoting violence itself. Where will, when will they come to that point? I don't know. At least I try to underline that here. But we'll see if it gets anywhere. Oh, yes, let me see if anybody has, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, go ahead. Right, so I guess my question is sort of uh, taking you to the founder. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, my question is about, you, must, you started with the distinction between guilt and responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's a very important distinction, and I just wanted to talk to you, hear you say a bit more about the relationship between learning about the past, knowing the past, Exactly. Um, so if you can say a bit more about how you can see that link. Yes. We see that is a very, maybe it's actually a, a good answer to what you have asked too, and I haven't, uh, I hadn't thought of that perspective. Thank you. The Turks, the first reaction the Turks have to the Armenian genocide is they say, we are not like the Nazis. I mean, you know, that is in a way they are so worried that they are going to be seen as, in the context of the Holocaust, as the destroyers. And they say, we weren't Nazis. And in a way, uh, they didn't. It was a gender genocide. They destroyed much more males than females or children. I mean, that were, unfortunately, Islamicized. Now there are, they think, about two to three million uh, people of Armenian descent in Turkey because of that. But nevertheless, and they say, we are not guilty. That's not the point. I mean, you know, that is when I think it's important. Of course, I also personally am not guilty, which was interesting because when they said, you know, when the person asked me, you know, why did you massacre my grandparents? Of course, the way he asked it is also very interesting, right? I mean, I mean he, they said, oh, there's somebody, you know, who's from there. Who may, you may want to know. I said, oh, sure, why not? You know, I'm thinking we're going to have Middle East food together or whatever. And then this person sort of comes and he says, where are you from? I say, Turkey. And then he's, the smile turned to this intense hatred in his face, I could see it. <coughs> I mean, I said, why is someone feeling so much hatred? And of course, the personal thing, my first reaction was to say, I didn't do anything, which of course is emphasizing the guilt part. But the responsibility part of it is that if we all say the same thing and do not do anything about it, we all go down as a society. 
So that is how one has to emphasize, as you say, not the guilt, but rather the responsibility. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, the first question is, we, you discussed briefly about the Kurds and how they've acknowledged yes. the Is there like a dialogue going on with Kurds and Armenians? You know, so, and then that's the first thing. And the second thing is, actually, I have two more. Uh, <laughs> You're going threes, OK. So, uh, so the, um, what do you think of the campaign uh, by Armenian diasporans to have the genocide recognized by different countries? Yeah. And you mentioned about this experience where the guy got upset at you. Have you had any other experiences with Armenian nationalists getting upset? I mean, uh, of being displeased with <laughs> I'll start from the, the, I mean, I was thinking I could literally write another book that's not academic, but like my memoirs, with respect <laughs> of, of working on this. For, from the Armenian perspective, which is understandable, because if you have denial, if you have denial for generations, I mean, you lose trust. You lose trust in humanity, one, and you lose trust in Turks especially, too, because obviously they are the perpetrators. For, so for, for a very long time, whenever I talked to an Armenian, I felt like they thought I was like Turkey personified, the Turkish state, and here I was. I mean, you know, and that was very hard for them to say, I mean, for me to get them to see, look, Turkish state is there and they do atrocious things, but I am a member of the civil society. I'm a scholar. I mean, I don't have those views, but they thought for a very long time I was an agent of, you know, uh, Turkey there to subvert them, pervert the issue or whatever, just like they thought Ron was an agent of the Turks. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, Armenians thought, because we started this thing, that he was either a CIA agent or an agent of the Turks out to get the Armenians, even though he himself is an Armenian. So this was fascinating in terms of the politics of how they reacted. They never, they never offered any money. <laughs> And the other thing, of course, is that, yes, they offered, they presumably offered me money because, of course, the Turks say I'm in the pay of the Armenians. So I usually in my talks say, where is this bank account? I'm supposed to be rich, but nobody gives me the bank account of, of the Armenians. You know, where did you put? So after one talk, this one guy came to me and said, I know he said that there is no bank account. Nevertheless, he says, I'm a, uh, I'm a dentist, so if you need any dental work done, <laughs> I'll be more than happy to offer you. I, this was happening in LA. So I said, but I live in Detroit. And he says, well, given how much we charge for dental work, believe me, you know, it, it, you'll save money by taking my offer. So in a way, there have also been, I mean, funny things like that. There is another people coming and saying, I had sworn never to shake the hand of a Turk, but I want to shake your hand. You, of course, shake it, but nevertheless, I mean, that demonstrates also, you know, uh, the problems uh, with it. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, there have been a lot of uh, reaction. What were the other two questions? Oh, the other two were, what do you I think have about other questions. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Very quickly. Okay. Okay. Then, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. And put it in a worldwide setting. Yes. Because I don't think any of this, from my own point of view, um, as somebody whose identity is constantly denied, yeah. I'm Native American and of African descent, African American descent, I'm always treated to as the well. margin. Um, yeah, I totally agree. This is the first. Yeah, yeah. Including the American Empire. Yeah. And uh, the real turning point, and I loved your turning point, yeah. is the Declaration of Human Rights. Yes, yes, from that point of view, you know, yes. Which comes after the terrible carnage yeah. of World War I and II. Yes, and yes. And that has really transformed the conversation. Totally, yes. Uh, for the whole planet. Well, the problem there is, of course, it has transformed it in theory, but in praxis, it hasn't. So next year, I'm, there are two things I'm doing in relation to that. After this, I want to study 
the violence against the Kurds. Because after they annihilated the Armenians, they used the same people, the same methods, to annihilate, annihilate the, the Kurds. And that is why the Kurdish recognition also you talked about is so important. In a way, they do work with Armenians. Uh, they uh, totally renovated a very significant Armenian church in Diyarbakir. They are holding conferences there. And for the uh, centennial, they'll be holding a uh, conference specifically in Diyarbakir with the Kurds and the Armenians to uh, highlight the, the, the, the uh, continuities in violence, which is what I'll be working on. But the other thing is next year, I've decided to bite the bullet and teach a course called Terrorism, Torture, and Violence. So I'm going full, I mean, because when you start seeing things from the perspective of violence, it is, in a way, very liberating. You can see the continuities uh, throughout. Uh, is there anyone else? Because, OK, your, your second one, OK. Uh, my question is that prior to 1920, there was no Turkish identity, per se. Yes, there wasn't. So can't you see the events prior to 1920 as a Muslim, Christian subjects of the Ottoman Empire for struggle, survival, yeah. power, whatever? I totally so agree. it's a Muslim-Christian conflict rather than Turkish-Armenian conflict. Well, this, uh, the problem is you can't reduce it to that because Muslims and Christians have lived together peacefully in many contexts and still continue to do so as well. That is why I think it's important to look at other factors, especially, as I said, the Muslims and Christians, you can say they do have potential for conflict. But why and how does that continue in a polarized way where people try to look beyond it. And they have, of course, with secularism and everything. And at one point, do they actually lead to conflict? That is, for me, the more interesting thing. And especially significant in that context is not what happened in the Ottoman Empire, but how could this happen in the Turkish Republic that was allegedly secular and that went to, wanted to create a Turkish identity? Uh, that was an umbrella identity of all the people living in Turkey rather than their ethnic or racial or religious origin. That is the big uh, puzzle that I tried to take on. <laughs> I think you and I will have to talk. <laughs> well, actually, hearing you speak, I could see a lot of similarities actually with the Polish Jewish yeah. case. Exactly, um, yeah. So there might be like comparative studies of denial, guilt, well, and responsibility. We, we can, can do it together. I <laughs> totally agree. Instead of torture, terrorism, and violence, and violence <laughs> denial, <laughs> responsibility, and guilt. Guilt. I like that, yes. So thank you very much. Please, you know, uh, get the book. It's available on Amazon <laughs> or at the Rocky. Either encourage local businesses or help <laughs> free things on Amazon. Yes. Uh, there's a book. And thank you so much for presenting. Thank you so, so much. Music.